Your blood vessels are carrying a huge load right now. Not weight, not stress in the emotional sense, but actual mechanical pressure pushing against the walls of every artery in your body. That pressure is happening in your brain, in your kidneys, in the vessels feeding your heart, and it's happening whether you feel it or not. Blood pressure isn't just a reading at your GP surgery that gets written down and filed away for years. It's a constant physical force that over months and years reshapes how your vessels behave, how hard your heart has to work, and whether those organs stay functional into your 70s or 80s. Hypertension is the most common under-medicated disease process in the developed world. It doesn't announce itself with pain or fatigue until the damage is already done, usually in the form of a stroke, a heart attack or kidney failure or vascular dementia. The problem is that for half a century, we've been told that the villain is salt. Cut your sodium and your pressure will drop. Except that hasn't worked for most people. What we're now understanding is that sugar has been driving blood pressure up through a completely different route. One that doesn't involve water retention, but instead locks your kidneys and arteries into a high pressure state hormonally. And most people have been treating the wrong mechanism. Hi, I'm Dr. Alex. I'm an emergency medicine doctor. And after nearly 10 years in the A&E, I've seen what happens when preventable disease isn't prevented. And my goal now is to help people avoid it in the first place and live longer, healthier lives. For the next couple of minutes, before we talk about sugar and salt, we need to understand what creates blood pressure in the first place. Blood pressure is the product of three forces and three forces only. The first one is cardiac output, which is how much blood your heart pushes out with each beat. The second one is blood volume, which is the total amount of fluid circulating in your system. The third one is vascular resistance, which is how relaxed or constricted your arteries are at any given moment. Now, if any one of those three goes up, your blood pressure rises. If all three go up together, your pressure can climb dangerously high. And the reason this matters is that your body has different ways of controlling each one. Cardiac output is controlled by heart rate and stroke volume, both of which respond to adrenaline and your autonomic nervous system. Blood volume is controlled by your kidneys, which decide how much sodium and water to hold onto or to excrete. Vascular resistance is controlled by the endothelium, the thin layer of cells lining every artery in your body, which produces nitric oxide to keep vessels relaxed and compliant. When nitric oxide production falls, vessels stiffen, resistance climbs, and pressure rises even if your heart rate and blood volume haven't changed at all. What becomes clear when you see the system this way is that your blood pressure isn't just one problem. It's the downstream result of kidney signaling, of endothelial health, of autonomic tone, and arterial compliance all interacting at once. That's why blanket advice like eat less salt works for some people and does almost nothing for others. The question isn't just what you eat, it's which part of your pressure system is breaking down and why. Okay, so if you're watching this video, you're probably worried about your health. And I just wanna take a few seconds here to make you a promise. I promise to keep creating the most helpful videos I possibly can, grounded in science and the latest research to help you live longer, to help you prevent the diseases I see in the emergency department every single day. And all I ask in return is that you give this fairly new channel a chance and hit the subscribe button. If you get to the end of this video, and you didn't think it was worth your time, or you've not learned something new, then feel free to unsubscribe. No hard feelings. But if you give me your time and your attention, I'll give you everything I've learned from over a decade in medicine. So please help me out. Hit the subscribe button to help this channel reach more people like you. And let's continue with the video. So, salt has been the primary target of blood pressure advice since the 1970s. And there's a reason for that. Sodium is osmotically active, which means wherever sodium goes, water follows. When you eat a meal high in salt, sodium gets absorbed into your bloodstream. And because your body wants to keep the concentration of sodium in your blood tightly controlled, it pulls water in from the surrounding tissues to dilute it. That increases your plasma volume temporarily, and more fluid in a closed circulatory system means higher pressure. 
It's basic fluid mechanics, not some complex hormonal cascade. The kidneys respond to that pressurize by activating the renal angiotensin aldosterone system, which is essentially your body's emergency pressure regulating network. When blood pressure climbs, the kidneys sense it and start excreting more sodium and water to bring the volume back down. When your pressure drops, the kidneys hold on to sodium to prevent the system from collapsing. This is a tightly controlled feedback loop and in a healthy metabolic state, it works beautifully. You eat more salt one day, your kidneys clear it out and your pressure stabilizes without any long-term change. The problem is that salt sensitivity exists on a spectrum. Some people, particularly those with impaired kidney function, reduced nitric oxide production or certain genetic variants, experience dramatic blood pressure rises from sodium intake. Others can consume high amounts of salt and show almost no pressure response because their kidneys and their vessels are still flexible enough to handle the volume shifts. What we've learned from decades of population studies is that salt primarily modulates pressure through water retention and plasma volume expansion, not through metabolic damage or chronic inflammation. And that distinction matters because it means salt is a volume problem, not a disease driver in itself. So sugar operates through a completely different mechanism, and it's one that most people have never heard about. When you eat refined carbohydrates or sugar, your blood glucose rises and your pancreas releases insulin to shuttle that glucose into cells. That's the story most people know. What they don't know is that insulin doesn't just lower your blood sugar. It also signals to the kidneys to hold on to sodium. Not because you've eaten more salt, but because insulin itself is a sodium retaining hormone. The more insulin you produce, the more sodium your kidneys absorb and the more water that gets pulled into your bloodstream as a result. This creates a pressure rise that has nothing to do with how much salt you've just eaten. You could be on a low sodium diet, but if your insulin is chronically elevated because you're eating processed carbs all the time, your kidneys are being told hormonally to retain sodium throughout the day. That's the first pathway. The second is that chronic insulin elevation activates the sympathetic nervous system, which increases your heart rate. It boosts cardiac output and constricts peripheral blood vessels. More output means more resistance and higher pressure. Now, the third pathway involves fructose, which is metabolized almost entirely in the liver. When fructose is broken down, it generates uric acid as a byproduct. Elevated uric acid has been shown in multiple studies to impair endothelial function, meaning it reduces nitric oxide availability and prevents arteries from relaxing properly. It also increases renal sodium reabsorption directly, independent of insulin. So fructose doesn't just raise blood sugar and insulin, it chemically alters how your kidneys handle sodium and how your blood vessels respond to pressure. Sugar is a dual action driver of hypertension, working through both kidney signaling and arterial stiffness. And it does this whether or not you've touched a salt shaker. Now, the interaction between insulin and sodium is where the real trap lives. In a metabolically healthy person, insulin rises after meals, signals to the kidneys to retain a little sodium temporarily, and then falls back to baseline once glucose is cleared. The kidneys then release that sodium, pressure normalizes, and the system resets. But in someone with insulin resistance, which describes the majority of adults in the UK and the US, insulin doesn't fall. It stays elevated throughout the day because cells aren't responding to it properly anymore. So the pancreas has to keep producing more just to maintain normal blood sugar. When insulin is chronically high, the kidneys never get the signal to release sodium. They're locked into retention mode. This is why so many patients reduce their salt intake to see almost no change in their blood pressure. They're treating the volume side of the equation while the hormonal control system is still holding onto sodium regardless of how much they're eating. The kidneys aren't passive filters, they're hormonally controlled pressure valves. And if the hormones are wrong, the valve stays closed. What makes this worse is that insulin resistance also damages the endothelium. High insulin levels over time reduce nitric oxide production, which means vessels lose their ability to relax. So you end up with a system where blood volume is being artificially expanded through sodium retention, and simultaneously, vascular resistance is climbing because the arteries 
can't dilate properly. Both arms of the blood pressure equation are being driven up at once, and cutting salt alone doesn't address either one of them. This is the metabolic pressure trap, and it's why lifestyle advice focused only on sodium reduction has failed for so many people over the last 50 years. If you look at the foods that dominate modern diets, what you'll notice is that they don't just contain salt or sugar in isolation. They contain both, engineered in specific ratios to maximize palatability and consumption. A single serving of many breakfast cereals, or ready meals, or fast food items will deliver high sodium and high refined carbs at the same time. That combination isn't accidental. It's deliberate food design, and the effect on blood pressure is far worse than either ingredient alone. When you eat processed food, you're getting sodium that immediately expands plasma volume through water retention, and you're getting refined carbs that spike insulin and lock your kidneys into that sodium retention mode. The result is that your blood pressure goes up from the volume load, and then it stays up because the hormonal signal to release that sodium never arrives. Again, you're hitting both pathways simultaneously. The sodium creates the initial pressure rise, and the sugar prevents your body from correcting it. That's why ultra-processed diets are so closely linked to hypertension, often more strongly than salt intake alone. Now, what complicates this further is that many processed foods are also low in potassium, which is the counterbalance to sodium in the body. Potassium helps the kidneys excrete sodium and supports vascular relaxation. Whole foods like vegetables, legumes, and unprocessed meats are naturally high in potassium and relatively low in sodium. Processed foods invert that ratio. You end up with high sodium, low potassium, high refined carbs, and often high fructose as well. It's a perfect storm for pressure dysregulation, and it explains why hypertension is overwhelmingly a disease of industrial food systems, not a problem caused by people seasoning their home-cooked meals. Now, when we understand what drives blood pressure up, we automatically understand what brings it down. It's two sides of the same coin. Now, biologically speaking, blood pressure falls when three things happen in the body. The first one, and this is crucial, is that insulin drops and stays low for extended periods. When that happens, it allows the kidneys to release sodium normally again, rather than holding onto it. The second mechanism involves endothelial nitric oxide production increasing, which essentially relaxes our blood vessels and reduces what we call vascular resistance. And the third lever, well, that's when renal sodium handling normalizes, meaning the kidneys start responding to actual sodium intake rather than being hormonally locked into retention mode. So those are our three levers. And here's the key point. Everything that genuinely lowers blood pressure long-term works through one or more of those mechanisms. Everything. Let me give you some concrete examples of how this works in practice. Physical activity is one of the most powerful blood pressure interventions we have, and the reason might surprise you. It's all about that nitric oxide again. When you exercise, particularly aerobic exercise, you create what's called a sheer stress on your blood vessel walls. This stimulates endothelium, that's the inner lining of your blood vessels, to produce more nitric oxide. Now here's where it gets really interesting. That effect doesn't just stop when you finish exercising. It lasts for hours after the session ends, which is precisely why regular movement creates sustained pressure reduction. And notice that I'm not talking about burning calories here or even losing weight, although those certainly help. What I'm talking about is turning your endothelium into a more active drug factory for vascular relaxation. That's the real mechanism at play. Now, moving on to diet. So, dietary fiber works through a completely different pathway, the insulin pathway that I mentioned earlier. What happens is that fiber slows glucose absorption, which flattens those post-meal blood sugar spikes that we all get. This, in turn, reduces the amount of insulin that your pancreas has to produce throughout the day. And remember what I said about insulin? Lower insulin means the kidneys aren't being constantly signaled to retain sodium, which allows natural pressure regulation to resume. It's beautifully simple when you think about it. Then we have sleep, which affects your blood pressure through yet another mechanism, the autonomic nervous system. Poor sleep increases what we call sympathetic tone, which raises your heart rate 
and constricts your blood vessels. On the flip side, deep restorative sleep allows the parasympathetic nervous system to take over, which lowers your cardiac output and your vascular resistance at the same time. It's literally like switching from the accelerator to the brake. So here's the bottom line, and this is what I really want you to take away from this. Blood pressure reduction isn't about cutting one ingredient from your diet or taking one magic supplement. What we're really talking about is a systems-wide hormonal recalibration. It happens when you restore the biological conditions your cardiovascular system was actually designed to operate in. That's the real secret to lasting pressure control. In emergency medicine, we see blood pressure in its most dangerous forms. Hypertensive crises, strokes from uncontrolled pressure, heart failure driven by years of elevated afterload. What becomes obvious when you work on the front line is that medication controls pressure, but it doesn't reverse the disease. An ACE inhibitor reduces angiotensin signaling, which lowers vascular resistance and brings pressure down. A diuretic forces the kidneys to excrete sodium, which reduces blood volume. A calcium channel blocker relaxes arterial smooth muscle, which drops resistance mechanically. All of these types of medication work, and they save lives, but they don't fix why the pressure was high in the first place. What I've seen repeatedly is that blood pressure medications work best when the metabolic drivers are already improving. A patient who's losing visceral fat, eating whole foods, moving regularly, and sleeping properly will often need lower doses or fewer medications to achieve the same pressure targets. And that's because the medication is acting on a system that's already starting to regulate itself better hormonally. The kidneys are handling sodium more appropriately. The endothelium is producing more nitric oxide, and insulin isn't chronically locking the system into retention mode anymore. There's also a clear distinction between patients who respond well to salt restriction and those who don't. Young, lean patients with primary hypertension often see significant pressure drops when they reduce their sodium intake because their kidneys and vessels are still flexible enough to adjust. Older patients with insulin resistance, with obesity or metabolic syndrome, rarely see meaningful change from salt restriction alone because their pressure is being driven hormonally, not just mechanically. That doesn't mean that salt doesn't matter to them. It means that salt isn't the primary driver and treating it as if it is will lead to frustration and non-compliance. Now, clinically, the patients who reverse their hypertension are the ones who address the metabolic foundation, not the ones who obsess over seasoning. So where does this leave us? Well, the question originally was salt versus sugar, but the real answer is that they're not opposing forces. They're two different mechanisms acting on the same pressure system. And in modern diets, they almost always appear together. Salt raises blood pressure temporarily by expanding plasma volume. That's fluid mechanics. Sugar locks blood pressure chronically by elevating insulin, activating the sympathetic nervous system, impairing endothelial function, and preventing the kidneys from releasing sodium properly. That's hormonal control. The reason decades of salt-focused public health advice hasn't solved the hypertension crisis is that we've been treating the volume side of the equation while ignoring the hormonal side. You can't fix a hormonally locked system just by reducing sodium intake. The kidneys wouldn't release it anyway. What actually lowers blood pressure for good is restoring the hormonal environment that allows kidneys to regulate sodium properly, vessels to relax normally, and cardiac output to settle. That happens when insulin falls, when nitric oxide rises, and processed food is replaced with whole food. Processed food is the real villain here because it weaponizes both sugar and salt simultaneously. It delivers sodium for the acute volume rise and refined carbs for the chronic hormonal lock. And it does this in a low potassium, low fiber context that prevents your body from correcting the damage. Hypertension is not fundamentally a salt problem or a sugar problem. It's a processed food problem that breaks blood pressure regulation at multiple points in the system. And finally, just to end, please subscribe to the channel if you found this useful to help me reach more people like you.